I'm Telly Mahoney and welcome back to The Good Room. Today we're talking about a good control room and I'm joined by the two mission critical market leaders, Jeff Willis and John Major. So John and Jeff, I understand that across industries, the control room might mean different things and it might have different functions. Could you please explain what a control room is from your perspective? Operators typically are sitting behind some sort of electronics and they're monitoring something out beyond where they are. It could be air traffic control. It could be planes and plane management. It could be cars on a freeway. It could be a process plant. Even the security operations center that is present and observable, but also behind the curtain, not observable for security of uh, high rise buildings, for example. And it could be a 911 control center. It could be any and all of those. Well, when we think about the, the variety of the control room types that you've just described, Jeff, you can imagine that it leads to a bunch of different form factors. But the things that most of the control rooms have in common is that there's a large screen at the front of the room that it contains most of the data that most of the operators within the control room need to see. And because that screen is such a focus of the room design, the floor is often tiered or has raised levels, uh, much like a movie theater. All of the control rooms are acoustically sensitive. Many of them have elevated supervisor viewing positions. All of them have a focus on both physical and cybersecurity because the operations within those buildings are very sensitive. And so you need to control and limit access to the room. Some of the control rooms do have windows which allow in natural daylight, but most do not. And that creates a lot of challenges for human comfort within the room. In a lot of cases, we find that the facilities have these common elements. In many cases, though, it's very specific to that industry for which they're working in. Operators in some industries will be segregated. They'll still be in the same room, but the information that they're reviewing will be very parsed and segregated because they're totally focused on their aspect of that process or operation. There might be a, a general wall that might, you know, have general information, but specific to their area it might be very targeted, very nuanced. So would that be, for example, in the dispatch center, how one person might be focusing on their own call, but if there was something that was more large scale, then they would look to that larger display? Absolutely. That's a great example. Another example might be a process plant where they have 10 or 15 different processes within that refinery. Their area of expertise is one portion of that. They'll be very specific and targeted to that because they know that process inside and out and how to respond appropriately to significant events. So could you tell me some about the ergonomic factors that you consider in the control room design? When I think about, you know, the human factors in the control room, it's it's a lot of different things. It's thermal comfort, it's acoustical privacy, it's the ergonomic comfort of moving up and down, sitting and standing. It's even the circadian rhythm comfort. If you're working at nighttime, it's a different experience in that control room than working in the daytime. So you have to consider that. We have to think about respite and a relief from the control room. You have to be able to go somewhere that feels different, that refreshes you. And finally, just the, the flexibility of the console is important because you're having shift changes. And so the console needs to have user settings that are easily transferable so that there's not any lost time when you're changing shifts from operator A to operator B or C. And when you think about the consequence of neglecting these human factors in the design, a huge consequence is operator fatigue. And that leads to employee dissatisfaction. And ultimately, that could lead to health deterioration for the individual. So the human factors, the ergonomics of the control room are essential for employee health, regardless of actually executing their their day to day activities. In rooms where there's no windows, you're trying to maintain that lighting at a constant level, trying to create an environment where the operator doesn't know what time it is outside. Very much like what they do in casinos. We'll typically design things like specialty lighting systems so that the operators believe that it's daytime when there actually might be three o'clock in the morning. Trying to trick the human biological clock into thinking that you're supposed to be up and working at that time when maybe you would normally be asleep. 
because there's multiple users in a control room, you're looking for the ambient lighting that is appropriate for most people. And then we use task lighting at the console itself for higher or lower illumination levels, depending on what they're doing. So most control rooms tend to be darker than your average room. And then they overcome the lower ambient level lighting with local task lighting. There must have to be training scenarios that go on. Do you design training spaces in the facility? Yeah, so in a lot of cases, there will be a primary and a backup, and they'll use the backup for training operations year-round. One, to keep the software fresh and current, but also to allow it to be used, whereas the main control room is where they operate 365 days a year. That's one of the most exciting things to me is that you get to build a duplicate of what's already there and incorporate some new technologies possibly. But essentially, you want those control rooms to be similar so that the training that you do on one is applicable to the one that's already in operation. And you're right, Jeff, we do see the, the mirrored control room scenario many times. In fact, all the control rooms that I've worked on are mirrors of the previous control room. And they use uh, the old one for training and the new one for primary operations. Yeah, and likewise. For a lot of them, it's it's been that backup control room or the primary control room. There's also in a lot of facilities, they'll come up with what they call an emergency operations center, which is separate and distinct. It's an extension of the control room for specialized events that occur, and they'll peel off a proportion of the staff to go work those problems in that emergency operations center. It'll have many of the same features as that main control room, just more specifically geared to those special events that are occurring or could be occurring, whether it's you know a shooting, whether it's a uh, an upset in the operation of, of a process operation, or a specific event that the that might be going on in the community that's being observed specifically because of its high prominence. They get used for a variety of different purposes. Yeah, Jeff, the, the EOCs, the emergency operations centers, are really cool because they do incorporate a control room, but they also have this command and control component that involves other aspects of emergency management, whether it's sleeping quarters or a kitchen operation or a marshalling post or a communications post. It really incorporates a lot of programmatic elements and they're very important structures in our society because it's, sadly we do have emergencies that occur, whether it's flooding or terrorism or any, any sort of disruption to the normal operation of our government. And we need a place to meet together and resolve our conflicts, dispatch the right resources and return to normal operations. And that's what the EOCs are for. Yeah, in many cases, these people will be there 12 hours a day, five days a week. And so there's a lot of activity that they need as part of their normal day that they can't just leave. They're so focused on the tasks at hand and so specialized that they just need to have all of these things that we would consider to be maybe separate and distinct from our office environment. They need to have them on premise. And so food service, being able to take a, a nap or being able to even get some fitness in. In many cases, it's not just those things that we would normally find in a, a office environment, but those that we might find in the in the greater community that they need to have right there immediately adjacent to where they work and operate. Is there space for privacy also? If you're in this space for many days, I imagine somebody might need a space to step out. Frequently, we'll design things that we call quiet spaces so they can go and they can find that quiet space, spend a little bit of time on their own. These are often very intense uh, situations. And so you can imagine when you're coming away from that, you need a way to decompress. You need a space that you can meet with and perhaps even a psychiatrist or psychologist to help you reorient, refocus on yourself and in your needs, that person's needs, not just the events of what's been occurring around them for the last you know, 24, 48 hours. 
the decompression room within a control center or control room is one of the most important programmatic elements for human comfort and employee retention. And that can take many forms. Sometimes those decompression rooms are just a quiet space. Sometimes they include a place where you can lay down and nap. Sometimes they're a place where you can cry. Some include music outlets. So there, you know, you can put some headphones on and there's some records. Sometimes it's games. It can take many forms, but all of the control rooms that are related to emergency response or emergency dispatch usually have this type of room. Paige did a project for a domestic violence hotline and it wasn't an emergency operation center or it wasn't a true control room, but it was a call center. And the operators there had to deal with some very traumatic things. And one of the reported successes of our project was the fact that our decompression room really allowed them to take the time to regroup and rejoin their colleagues on the operations floor. It was a more familiar room in that it looked like a living room. Some of the decompression rooms within a control room facility aren't as comfortable as that, but this one was specifically designed to emulate a living room so that it would, for the operators, it would feel very familiar to them and not feel like a job. It would feel like it was home and they could let themselves go in that room. Changing gears, I also wanted to talk about the security needs because these are places with highly sensitive information inside of it. So can you please tell me what considerations you incorporate into the design when it comes to security? One of the features of a control room is they're often very high security because control rooms can provide control of systems. And if a bad actor gains access to the room, they could take it down. They could take down the operations of, of the business. So it's not just about physical security into the room, but also radio frequency security. So a lot of devices emit a radio frequency, which could be eavesdropped upon. And so there are ways to harden the facility to prevent eavesdropping of the communications that happen within that room. Yeah, frequently we'll design these rooms where we'll have rings of security. So the, the most holy of holies, if you will, is that communication center at the center. But there's a lot of different people who need to access those types of facilities for other purposes, whether they're pulling a permit so that they can do some work in a classified area or whether they're doing just normal check-in, check-out of areas that they're working in so that people know where folks are within the facility. But each one of those has individual rings of security that requires a different level of sophistication and a different level of badging to gain access. And oftentimes those security features include biometric devices that read either retinas or fingerprint scanners, but there's usually a two-factor ID, which is your card, your access card plus something that's physical and specific to you. And then when it comes to cybersecurity, we build in redundant and protected systems within the building so that depending on the threat, if one of the core component of the building, like a mechanical or electrical system is compromised, there's a backup for that. Or sometimes telecommunications and fiber communications need to be protected from eavesdropping. And so there's various ways that our teams go about providing that security. I'm curious about the future. So what are some of the things that you might see coming down the pipeline in the next 5, 10, 25 years? So historically, control rooms featured a large screen at the front of the room. And going back many years, there was no such device that was a great big TV. The screens were kind of small. So if you needed to make a display that was 30 feet long and 10 feet tall, you'd have to assemble a bunch of screens together. It started a long time ago with rear projectors, and then that technology was quickly eclipsed by LED displays, and then further eclipsed by frameless LED displays. So you can basically create a seamless image across a 30-foot wall. And the screen technology, I believe, will continue to evolve, but it's the way that that data is moved around on the screen that seems to be changing with software development. If you think about touch screens and haptic feedback and even sort of voice interaction, I suspect we will be able to move data around either a large screen on the wall 
or a screen on your desk that whereas we used to have three or four monitors and each one had a thing, there might be one large monitor that you can drag and drop and click and move stuff around for your own individual preference. And the impact of that is that it will decrease the size of the console because instead of having five screens or six screens, now you have one that you can customize for your own format. And so if you reduce the size of the screen, you reduce the size of the console, you reduce the size of the console, you can shrink down the room and make it a more compact and efficient space. We're going to see much more of that occurring. I tend to think about this as the way that we've come a long way since we had to have manuals to be able to operate our devices. Today, they're intuitive. The way we display information, the way that we communicate that necessary information has changed dramatically. We've learned so much about how to do that without people having to study a manual to understand it. It's just that intuitive, I know what this information means. I believe that's gonna continue to change the industry and cause it to pivot about exactly what gets displayed and how, and and there's probably technologies that we're not even aware of yet that's gonna take that from 2D to 3D that Uh, will allow us to be able to process data in ways that we hadn't thought of six months ago. Yeah, I think we're going to have to be on our toes in terms of specifying technology for control rooms. In the old days, the screen technology was evolving so quickly that if the design process took nine months, you would wait until the last month to specify the screen technology because it evolved so fast. So if you described what you wanted eight months earlier, there was a new and better product. And so there was a just a custom that we would wait to the very last minute to specify the screen. And that impacted the design process in that you had this big hole in the design that you were kind of waiting to fill in. And if it evolved that you didn't have room, then you'd have to quickly make the building larger to accommodate the screen design. So I suspect that the technology will continue to evolve even faster and that we'll have difficulty keeping up with the appropriate technology to use in a control room because it's evolving so quickly. Well, thank you so much, John and Jeff, for joining me today on The Good Room. And thank you for everybody who's listening. Please don't forget to subscribe to be notified when our next episode is released. 